So this is Keith Bradby and we're taking you on a journey through Gondwana Link. And we want to acknowledge first off that we're not only on Noongar country and Naju country, but we're also building on the the elders of the white community as too, the, the people who started the land care movement and helped repair a lot of the country, the people who stopped logging in the forest, the early scientists. And when I say early scientists for here, I can be talking about the 1980s, there's a slide there which includes um, the discovery of about half the pre-European mammal population of the Fitzgerald River National Park. That'd be about 1987 we did that. Same decade that a particular botanist, Ken Newby, just about trebled the plant list for that park. It's, it's been a big journey for southwestern Australia. It, when I came here in 1976, it was a sort of sandy, infertile, scrubby corner of back corner of the Australian continent. We now know it's the biologically richest corner of the Australian continent, that the scrubby knee-high um, sand plain scrub is as rich as rainforest. And there's a great little video <coughs> the Minute Earth people have put out with the Kongan Foundation explaining why basically poor places are more diverse, why the, the Kwangan, the Heathlands, the Mallee, the Scrub is now up there on the stage with, with the rainforest, the tropical rainforest of the world as, as the more diverse, biodiverse places on Earth. It's got a bit of a grim history here though. I mean they're still clearing the Amazon big scale. Our, our botanical, biological Amazon um, was cleared mainly in the 1950s and 1960s. We didn't know much about it then. We don't know much more about it now. But one thing that did happen that had an absolutely profound effect on my thinking was that in the late 1970s the WA Museum did the biological survey of the wheat belt. They started to find out what was there and they also applied a bit of mathematics to it using the, the recently documented science of island biogeography. The science that says that the smaller an area of habitat, the less species it can sustain over time. And their, for me, quite shocking conclusion was that for birds you needed reserves in the order of 30 to 94,000 hectares to conserve most of the bird species and that you needed at least 40,000 hectares to conserve the, the regional assemblage of mammals. And in the wheat belt itself, we've only got one reserve of that size. So across 18 or 19 million hectares, there's only the 40 or so thousand hectares of, of Lake Magenta Nature Reserve that um, can keep what we once had. So no matter how much you work with rare species and this and that and the other, if, if you're stuck with only doing it in small, fragmented, isolated bits of bush, eventually you're stuffed. And that's not just a WA picture, it, it's pretty much what we've been doing across the world for a long time. This slide shows you the um, the degradation, the loss of habitat across the global biosphere since 1750 and you can see that rapid increase in, from 1950 on which is exactly what happened in southwestern Australia. Um, we really ramped up the, the land clearing from, from that point. Now as disturbing as that slide is, there's a far more disturbing paper called The Great Acceleration which brings together a whole bundle of trends both in terms of our socio-economic stuff, the world population, energy use, water use and so on, along with the, the earth system trends, carbon dioxide, methane, ocean acidification, and they all show that enormous rise. They're all graphed from 1750 on and they all show that enormous um, increase in intensity and impact since the 1950s. So. It's no wonder then, as this cartoonist puts it in this slide, that um, it's now recognised where we are leaving that benign time in Earth's climate that 
Human civilization has arisen, the Holocene. We are leaving it. We are moving very fast and very rapidly into the unknown, a place that scientists have dubbed the Anthropocene. How do we respond to this? Well, this slide suggests that we do what we are doing. We can stick our head in the sand and we can pretend it's not happening. Um, we can keep pottering around with a few rare species and a few little specialist bits of habitat and national park and say that's going to be enough. Um, we can keep growing as a economically as a community. We can keep burning coal, I guess, at the extreme end. That's pretty much societal response to this date, despite all the global treaties and so on. But we just decided that down in this important part of the world, we weren't prepared to do that. So in 2002, a bunch of us got together, and it was a pretty small bunch, and it was triggered by the, the, the support we were given from the global group, the Nature Conservancy. But a few of us down here on the south, south coast said, let's, let's grab the one big opportunity we have to have functioning ecosystems again across southwestern Australia. We drew a swish on a map, and within that swish, we have much of the south, wet southwest forests. We have the few remaining large Mallee and Heathland reserves. And we've got this wonderful bit of bush east of the, the wheat belt, east of the barrier f fence, which was built to keep out rabbits from coming west and is, is now maintained to try and stop wildlife from, from, from coming west. Um, we said, well, across that area, if we can keep that bit healthy, if we can reconnect the habitat, if we can restore ecological function there, then at least a fair semblance of, of what worked across this landscape for the last 250 million years can continue. And I'll just stress that point. 250 million years of continuous evolution in this landscape, and we've drastically, drastically altered it in the last 50 or 60 possibly the biggest disruption in those in that huge length of time. Why do we think the Gondwanalik area is that important? What we list on this slide are the, the key features. We've got over 75% of the plant taxa in southwestern Australia and that's over 20% of Australia's plant taxa all in that one area. Our largest habitat areas, the most complete faunal assemblages, a lot of the rare plants and the rare species, the rare animals, um, including a number that of mammals and that were thought extinct, but we've rediscovered in the last 30 years, re rediscovered remnant populations of. It ranks as the world's least disturbed area of Mediterranean habitat, those places that get dry summers and wet winters, even though that is changing. It's it's got lots of discrete places that have been mapped as climate refugia and it is that movement zone between the wet and dry systems. And we would argue, and we all know that as definitive as climate science is, we're in for some real surprises. But we think we're the most climatically buffered section of the southwest biodiversity hotspot. The human stuff we have going for us here, of course, is that we are starting to respect the the traditional land management of the Noongar people and learning what we can from that. And we have had 30, 40, 50, 60 years of the some of Australia's, certainly rural Australia's, earliest land care and environmental groups. And a number of them are still functioning. So we're building from a great foundation. These maps show us a couple of things. One is it, it's Steve Hopper and Paul Goyer's work defining the botanical hotspots within the southwest hotspot, the, those areas with the highest species richness. We have captured, if you like, most of them along Gondwanali. But the more detailed map shows you that they're not all in national parks. In fact, either side of Stirling Range National Park are two really important areas. The Stirling Range through to um, Wellstead Green Range, the bottom of the Fitzsterling area, and the whole Calgon Valley are really important um, 
areas for high species richness and of course most of them are now in private land so we can't rely on our for another reason we can't rely on our our reserve system we have to work in the settled landscape when we kicked off you know it, how do you get this moving you you've had all these government funding programs and bits and pieces for a very long time we had to be far more ambitious and we needed the freedom to be far more ambitious and our friends in the Nature Conservancy started us off on the very right approach to achieve that generosity and goodwill we are in the generosity and goodwill business the core work of achieving Gondwana Link has always been privately funded people have donated um, out of the goodness of their heart, out of their, their concern for the well-being of the earth and we have met some of the most spectacular people through, through this. Who are we? Well we started off, and I will use the royal we a bit in all this and that's the name of, that's the collective effort by a whole bunch of groups. We started off with an initial six groups spanning the spectrum across local land care groups, local farmer groups, local friends of groups um, and some big national groups the, the Nature Conservancy a global group groups that did hands-on stuff, groups that did advocacy groups that were really pressed up for a few dollars to operate through to groups um, with huge budgets and I think to some extent it was the first time that all worked together in a program. Since then it's grown to must be something like 20 or so groups. You know it's a loose collaboration, they don't get together very often, a lot of them don't know what each other are doing. Gone one link itself, the two people who've been here since inception try and be the glue between all these efforts, helping these people stay focused on what they're good at doing and most want to do which is their local areas um, while helping those local efforts add up into something much bigger. This slide just gives us a few insights into our structure. Since 2000 and since we started in August 2002 and since February 2003 it's been Amanda Keesing and myself. Um, it's Amanda in the photo there that's my little son Jack on her knee. He's now taller than I am. A um, couple of key principles in how we operate. It's, it hasn't been about building a great big new inner thing. It's about keeping the strengths in the groups doing the work and the focus on the tangible achievements, the momentum and the strength and relationships. Um, a lot of those groups have become um, stronger through being part of this work. Our role in the middle has encompassed most things you can imagine anyone doing. We help out where we need it, we provide pooled resources, we help the learning set share, we, we maintain the vision and the leadership, um, we've plugged a few gaps over time and, and help groups grow up to the point where they can do that fill that gap themselves. We don't try and get all the groups to work through us and I've got to sign off on any, everything or any of that nonsense. Um, we encourage to the greatest extent all the groups to have cooperative arrangements across and between them, do their own deals between each other as, as needed. It's generally thought that you couldn't tackle something this big without a, you know, a detailed plan and strategy that probably would take five years to write and um, you need a forklift to carry it around and it would be out of date before you even start implementing it. That's not what we did. As this slide shows when we started in 2002 we had four clear strategies, four simple points that we were focused on doing and we worked with the greatest amount of adaptability we could. We didn't know what we were getting into really, no one had done this before and we didn't know what sort of structure was going to be working best. And you know we were lucky in that the Conservancy arranged a, a wonderful person to make a, a million dollar contribution at the beginning 
and if we'd used that for planning we might have ended up with a plan but we wouldn't have any resources left and we wouldn't have any momentum so we as those four dots say we articulated a compelling vision for the future that that lifted us from all the countering threats and and so on that everyone had been absorbed by you know we were clearly about transforming the landscapes we built momentum by doing stuff, by focusing on two initial key areas and doing large-scale change on the ground. While that was happening, Amanda and myself bought what, built what support mechanisms we could to underpin the expansion. And, you know, there has been a, a, a steady rollout since then. Four key dot points to start with, and it's pretty much what we've been doing ever since. This slide gives you a, a taste of um, the change that has been happening in, in one of those initial two areas where we started working in the fragmented agricultural areas between the Stirling Range and Fitzgerald River National Park. It's about 72 kilometres across there um, and at, at, we're lucky I guess or we positioned the program correctly I guess is a better phrase um, in that there was quite a bit of bush left across that landscape it had only been cleared from the late 50s early 1960s onwards a lot of it possibly should never have even been considered for agriculture and a number of farmers had um, not fully cleared their properties I guess is the best way of saying it so in the time since we've been been operating uh, there's something like 12 or 13,000 hectares being reclaimed for conservation. Some of it was existing habitat. Quite a bit of it has been, probably I think at about 4,500 hectares at this point, has been paddock that um, has been actively restored back onto an ecological trajectory. Um, and we've also worked as strongly as we can with the farming community to help them um, restore and manage important areas on their properties that they were happy to give up. And that was a program that one of the, that Shell Oil funded and we thought well you might get a few five or ten hectare areas um, and that by the end of its five year program, that's all the little yellow stars, um, we, we had farmers giving up over a hundred hectares in one, one batch. There's a lot of enthusiasm and, and goodwill out there in the farming world. We have done what we, we've called a functional landscape plan for this area. This was, I think, in year two or year three. We got down to that seriously. We used Butte Better Software Conservation Action Planning that the Nature Conservancy introduced us to and trained us in. Um, and it's it's pretty robust under time, although getting groups to find the time to sit around the table and review it and update it and make sure it is adaptive management is, is always a challenge. The properties that have been secured is quite a mix. There's properties that Green Australia and Bush Heritage Australia have purchased. There's quite a few properties that individual conservationists have purchased. Um, virtually all attracted in by our work in the landscape and their desire to help us and also be part of a cooperative effort. And there's some big lumps of, of land there that we found funding for fencing and the farmers involved were prepared to fence off and put under a protective conservation covenant. I guess it's pretty obvious from that slide that um, we'd like to eventually build a solid band of bush maybe even a couple of kilometres wide between the two national parks and in effect make them one big habitat. We'll get there. But in the meantime, we are reducing the gap. We're making it much easier for species to move. And we recognise that not all wildlife moves in some sort of straight line backwards and forwards. A lot of the birds, carnabies, cockatoos and so on, they, they move around. So we've worked over much larger parts of the landscape with those um, plantings on farms to create a more ecologically permeable landscape within which the core corridor sits. This slide showing some of the very valuable bushland that has been protected by this process. 
Um, there's a, a mallet breakaway there. I mean, what sort of government would expect a farmer to clear that? Even more so when you realise that on top of it is a, a Eucalyptus arborea, the only population of that outside of Fitzgerald River National Park, where it also only exists on the top of a couple of small mesas. And last time I had a look, there's, there were three rare and endangered plant species down the slopes of that very mesa. And uh, the guys in Bush Heritage, there's Angela Sanders and Libby Sanderford, Libby the consulting botanist, have been doing more intensive survey across these properties and discovering that, as we expected, they are at least as rich as the adjoining national parks, if not much richer. The even more challenging work has been um, securing the funds to buy whole farms and securing the funds to take the gamble that we could turn those farms back into pretty good habitat, if not back on the, a trajectory that would see them become bush again. We've been very fortunate in that one of the people who's been attracted to work here is Justin Johnson, a very committed ecological restorationist. Um, you can see him in this slide in the, in the middle of a farm that was purchased for $1.7 million. And um, for the cleared areas has had $1,500 to $2,000 a hectare spent on direct seeding. And we had our fingers crossed there for a few years. But in the bottom corner, you can see a picture of, of Justin standing in front of the result. We have got the bush back. There is a lot of wildlife living on this property now. Now, Justin didn't, didn't just do a broad acre um, planting system. He worked out the carbon allometrics that told us how much carbon we could grow on this property. Greening Australia then managed to lure uh, Mir Mirabella light bulbs into funding the plantings on the basis of the carbon sequestered. He then designed a planting regime that mimicked the, the incredibly tight mosaic of bushland species and, and vegetation communities and built a machine that enabled him to do 20 to 30 hectares an hour. Um, fantastic bit of work that lifted the standard of work across here from revegetation through to true ecological restoration. And here's some later work that Justin did. I think that one's on one of the Bush Heritage properties. Um, you can barely walk through it. It's above his head. It's thick. It's got somewhere either side of a hundred plant species in it. It was all direct seeded very economically and it's only three years old. Absolutely going gangbusters. Similarly, you can see a, another three year picture on Bill and Jane Thompson's Yarrawea property. Um, Bill and Jane, wonderful couple, one of the conservation buyers we've helped to attract in here. They've come later in life. They've bought a, I think it's around 1400 hectares, um, half paddock, half, very valuable bushland. They've put another, and perhaps a good example of, of what Amanda and I do in the heart of Gondwanalink. We do it quietly, a bit behind the scenes. Some people think we're marriage brokers. So we talked to Bill and Jane for a couple of years before they decided to make their move over from Queensland. We showed them around a number of properties. They selected this one. We then introduced them to Carbon Neutral who said, oh yeah, we'd love to plant a bit more with you. Um, we then helped them apply for biodiversity fund money from the Australian government, which they matched with the carbon neutral money. Justin Johnson's company, Threshold Inter Environmental, came in and did the plantings, and now um, they have a partnership with Bush Heritage to help them manage the property into the long term. It's that wonderful combination and integration of what what is around there but needs to be brought together into a, a unified package that, that underpins a lot of the great things happening across the link. This slide is the Fitz, uh, slice of the Fitzsterling landscape which 
which shows again how we're bringing numerous elements together or how we're encouraging numerous elements to come together um, we're not directing all this we're just coaxing it into happening so in the foreground you've got the now and up property um, center foreground you've you've got a big area of bush that was initially cleared but the commissioner for soil and land conservation said no nah, too fragile and and stop the clearing you've got incredibly valuable mesa habitat you've got some early revegetation restoration plantings that Greening Australia have done you've got a property owned by the conservation buyer Norman Pater where we're working with carbon neutral he has um, replanted most much of it and we're now in the process of pulling down the fences and, and operating both properties as single properties. On the left side you've got a, the Karakarup River Reserve, on the right side you've got Karakarup Nature Reserve, the now and up property now joins them. Um, you've, you've then got a, a, a sliver of bush and a bit of a paddock in the middle right of the photo which is Bush Heritage's Monjabup Reserve that connects through to more of their Monjabup Reserve and Bill and Jane's and you can see where it's all heading the Stirling Ranges. Mix of land uses, mix of fundings, um, mix of techniques, mix of ownership, one program. Uh, this slide is a, a really 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 important one for me. Not long after Greening Australia secured the now and up property we thought well actually you know we're doing all this in Noongar land and we haven't had a good yarn to them yet about what they'd like. So we tagged up with um, Eugene Eads, a very very impressive Noongar man and said what do we do? And he said well I'll get a bunch of elders together and we'll go out and talk about it. So we took a number of key elders, and I won't name them because tragic, sadly, three of them have since passed on. Um, we took them out to the now and up property and said, look, you know, we've only bought this in the last few months. Um, we've got a number of other properties. We know this is Noongar land. How do we respect that? And, um, you know, we're, we're going to pull down the fences. There's not going to be a gate here. You don't need to feel constrained. What would you like? And those elders um, came back with a much larger group of elders, some of whom hadn't been getting on all that well, but were very happy to to work together when there was some of their land involved. And they they gave Eugene a set of instructions on what they wanted done on this property. Um, the now and up property has ended up being one that was important to them long time before it became a, a, a white person's farm um, and I haven't pried into what that is but I do know there's some significant importances out out there and um, Greening Australia have been very happy to support Eugene to um, use the property ever since while it's being restored we've seen the landscape being brought back to health and we've we've given a lot of support for the Noongar community to work on their health healthy people, healthy country. Um, this selection of photos shows some of the activity that's happened both on that property and across that whole Fitzsterling area. Centre top is a gathering of, of people including quite a number of stolen generation survivors um, who've had a number of very important and very poignant um, gatherings on now and up. But the local schools have been out there We've got other conservation neighbours nowadays. We've had the artists running various projects and um, a lot of us are learning to start looking after the country in our way. It's gained a lot of international attention too. Here's a, a picture of Eugene on a brochure that Amnesty International had put out on the, the difficulties of, of life as a Noongar and the, the changes that we're we're all trying to make to make things better. And this slide shows 
a really interesting twist that the interaction between our ecological focus and the cultural focus is bringing. Um, we, we'd been going ahead planting this country back in the normal straight lines using our normal machinery and what have we and then at some point Eugene Eads and Justin Johnson had a conversation about that and realised that whoops <laughs> we're not really thinking about the cultural importance of what we're doing and where we're doing it. So I I call this the 10 acre dot painting but it's a it's a design that Eugene and Justin came up with to represent a number of main families, to provide those families with their important area. Um, it's now three or four years old and it's been planted to those designs and you, you can see it coming up. This has led to a number of other projects which has helped the Noongar community um, rebuild their mark on the country. Um, and in this this example that's just come up, we've helped them plant a 300 metre long goanna, kada, kada the goanna, kada is not half a goanna, it's the word we should use. On another one of the properties that Greening Australia has, it's been planted by a, a now and up Noongar ranger team that we're helping support and, and that newspaper article is actually a full page story in the National Koori Times which which is a really proud place for for both us and and Eugene and the Noongar team to be showcased. Now I've used what's been happening in that one bit of the link, the Fitzsterling, as an example of what's starting to happen everywhere. Um, this slide shows one of the other groups. This is the, the Rangers Link, some of the Rangers Link crew from between the Prongrups and the Stirling Range National Parks. They've been doing great work for years and you know it's, it's, it's that bit trapped into that bits of projects here and there stuff that is all small local groups have been able to get funding for in the past. They, the work they've been doing and the knowledge they hold of their landscape has inspired us. The more ambitious scale we've been able to work in the Fitzsterling has helped inspire them. I think it's, it's that mixture of people power plus the extra planning support and, and ambition that we've been able to encourage them with is making a huge difference across there. They, they already owned one property, the Twin Creeks Conservation Reserve. Peter Luscombe, one of the, the men there, already owned his, his own conservation property that dated back to the 1980s. And you know we're helping them implement a program to, to build from that foundation to one day have ecological movement between two key national parks across a critical climate zone. Prongrups National Park is wet carry. Stirling Range National Park, 22 kilometres away, is marg largely Mallee and Heathland. And as with the Fitzsterling and as with the Forest of Stirling and the Lindsay Link and the other areas that have where stuff is really happening across Gondwana Link nowadays, there is a huge amount of social interaction with the community. Um, there's a huge range of other activities happening. This mix of photos, you know, it shows the 110 hectare fauna exclosure that the Hordaker family and worked with Green Skills to put on their property. It's full of bandicoots already, and um, I think we're going to have to start talking about throwing them over the fence soon. Um, kids out there doing surveys, adults on hills, cam camera trapping showing what we've got in these places, cockatoo hollows being hoisted up into trees, botanical surveys and, and art groups doing some absolutely spectacular work. I think this is the Gondwana Landscapes exhibition in Denmark a couple of years ago now. There's always been that question that gee shouldn't you be doing some more science? Shouldn't you know exactly what you need to do? Shouldn't you get more plans? Well, we've never had the money for that. We, we've stuck to doing the fundamentally important stuff, but it's a matter of great pride that we have now provided significant opportunity for others to come in, 
do the science they're keen on doing and do it in, do it in a way that um, gives us the much more detailed information we need to to refine the practices and get better and better and better at doing it. It's doing while you learn, yes, but it, it's been a good synergy and it's the only way we could have really um, afforded to do things. There's a few pictures there of one of the great conservation landholders, Eddie Wayon, doing some some uh, fox baiting and other survey and survey work of birds on his property and we've got the team that have come together in a quite large Australian Research Council linkage grant to look at the measures of restoration success genetically and and are we um, are we just planting stuff and gardening or are we actually rebuilding the evolutionary processes that are so vital in these landscapes. Now with this slide I want to take us into a very very different part of the link. Um, the the second significant program we we kicked off um, probably from about 2004 onwards and initially driven pretty strongly by the Wilderness Society. The Great Western Woodlands it's now called. Never used to have a name. It's actually the largest remaining temperate woodland on earth. This slide shows you where it, it sits. It also shows that it's a mix of land use. Um, it's got some A-class nature reserves, it's got some big C-class reserves, it's got some pastoral properties, it's got a couple of towns, Kalgoorlie, Kilgardie, Norseman, Cambelda, and it's got a heap of mining tenements. It's amongst the most mineralised zones in Australia. But it is still largely intact. It, it is mainly there. It's had some logging in the past for mine props and, and, and fuel and so on. But the Great Western Woodlands is largely intact and has much of the life that was originally in it. Um, the name came from Harry Recker and isn't it incredible in this day and age you can take an area that's largely ignored, um, you can actually give it a name but you can do a bit of initial science and discover the largest remaining temperate woodland on, woodland on earth that we've been ignoring. Beautiful country, here's some youngish salmon gum country in the afternoon light um, you can drive through hundreds of kilometres of this. Now what what has been essential to getting the woodlands up as and getting it recognised for its conservation importance is really together has really been a matter of pulling together the the knowledge we already had scattered around the place and a lot of that work was done by a wonderful young fellow Alexander Watson, largely funded by two um, outside funders, the Pew Environment Group as they were then, Pew, from Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Nature Conservancy. And there you've got Barry Trail and Michael Looker from those two organisations. And it's interesting, we're getting controversy at the moment over whether or not um, overseas bodies should be funding conservation work in Australia. Well, I'm just bloody embarrassed that Australian organisations hadn't already done that. Alexander pulled the science together, put in front of the then Minister for Environment. He um, was delighted to launch the Woodlands Report. Sonny Graham and Naju Elder not only co-launched the report, but, s but sung us some great songs in, in Naju. And almost, um, well anyway, within a few months of this launch the WA government called a snap election. The Wilderness Society and Alexander and his colleagues did some wonderful footwork and got bipartisan support for the conservation and management of the Great Western Woodlands and some money committed. It's, it was moving along. 
Now here you can see the, the government's biodiversity and cultural conservation strategy for the woodlands. We helped them develop that over a couple of years. I must say we were pretty hopeful that we could now fade away and um, be a bit redundant and everything would go hunky-dory out here but as is often the case that's not what happened. Haven't got to the happy ending yet. Um, government did a reasonably good strategy, we helped them write it and then they spent most of their available money bulldozing fire lines and trails um, through the woodlands. Um, I think the plan was to do 2300 kilometres don't think they quite got it all done. Outraged a number of us, outraged a number of local government authorities who knew what that extra, the risk that that extra access brought in terms of fire and knew what would be moving through those woodlands in terms of weeds and that from now on. You can't further fragment these areas safely. So there was a bit of a parting of the ways and um, we formed a, a woodlands initiative to um, work together with key local governments and our friends from the Prospectors and Leaseholders Association and, and others on better management of woodlands. One of the mining companies, Cliffs Natural Resources, um, funded an overall planning approach, approach to help all the people say what they needed, so what they felt needed to be done. Um, that came together in quite an impressive document which told us that you know, 16 million hectares is a big bite you, you might want to plan it in local bits which we've been progressively doing ever since um, the first cab off the rank was the granite and woodlands plan done with the, the Shire of Condinan and the Shire of Dundas traditional owners, three different groups of traditional owners and two nickel miners and um, the photo in the top right shows one of the adjoining farmers to that bit of the woodlands, Robbie Trenorden. Off their own bat those guys had been going out and filling in the ghost holes, the, the old drill holes from mining exploration that had become uncapped and which are a lethal trap for small vertebrates and pygmy possums and little lizards and such animals. They fall down those holes, they don't get out again. As with the rest of the link, there has been a, a significant increase in the good science that's happening. Um, you know, who knows what happening across the link we've led to, or what might have happened anyway, or what is a combination. But we've certainly seen an absolute explosion of scientific research in the Great Western Woodlands. Some of it has been absolutely pivotal to understanding how we need to manage it. Some work which we're incredibly pleased with by Carl Gosper, Colin Yates and Suzanne Prober has explored the fire regimes we need for health out there and the, in, in many ways the shock result was that fire intervals of less than 200 years are likely to have adverse consequences on diversity um, and there's been a hell of a lot of fires, big hot fires in the last 30 or 40 years They've also, um, they've also um, demonstrated that the older these systems get, the less fire prone they are, and generally the more biologically diverse they are. Yeah, that's a bit of a rewriting of this story that the country needs to be burnt every few decades. Um, and they've also demonstrated that those gimlet woodlands and salmon gum woodlands and others they start to mature around the 500 year age. Really, really exciting. Um, Heather Keith, Sandy Berry and Brendan Mackey at ANU have, were um, funded by the Wilderness Society to also look at fire and carbon. Carbon's the one thing that this, this human, that this planet needs us to keep in the ground or in the vegetation and um, that initial work by, by the ANU team has shown that if we manage fire really carefully across the woodlands as we should then the potential over time is to lock up an extra eight to nine hundred million tonnes of carbon in the vegetation and in the soil. So how do you achieve that? 
Well, given that government had stymied a lot of the more progressive approaches um, and had made it very clear there would be no tenure change, there would be no extra protected areas in the woodlands, we felt a bit blocked. But over all this period we had been talking with all the traditional owners and have built a really close relationship with the Naju people and it's come as a great time for both of us. Naju, after fighting in the courts for 18 years, were finally granted their native title, or finally had their native title recognised, which I think is the best way of saying it, and were granted legally exclusive native title over more than four and a half million hectares of the woodlands. Woohoo! So we fight them in the courts, we the the other people of Australia. For 18 years we fight them and then when they get recognised for what they already, what they've always had, ownership and and um, belonging to the woodlands, we, we tend to just leave them alone then, but not us. We've stepped up, we've rattled the tin around the place and brought a whole heap of funding together and have helped the Naju develop a conservation action plan so they can manage this country. Working with um, Fire and Emergency Services and the Shire of Dundas. We've helped them form a fire brigade, which is the, the only rural fire brigade for a few hundred kilometres out there. And that's been on the basis that they want to get back to traditional burning of that country. And we all need them to be able to put out small fires while they're small, which is a hell of a lot easier than waiting for them to become big, which is what's happened in the past. We're also helping them control a number of other problems out there and in the bottom right of this slide you can see the first training session on chemical use we did for the Nanaju Rangers and they took us down to a particular spot and said you know we, we're really worried about this weed that's down there we, can we take it out and we looked at it weren't sure what it was hadn't seen it before it turned out to be quite a few acres of Nagura burr which if that came into the, the farming country of southwestern Australia would cost wool growers tens of millions of dollars every year. So Anaju have fixed that. Just one of the fantastic byproducts you get when you work with good people on the ground. One of the other bits of science that's happened is the Nature Conservancy and BirdLife Australia have started intensive bird survey across the woodlands. Started with some money from the Thomas Foundation and some professional support and BirdLife Australia, the group here in WA, have been continuing it with volunteers. But, you know, 3,269 bird surveys conducted so far. Huge increase in knowledge and, and has helped us underline the fact that um, our knowledge of these areas is still at a pretty low base and we, we, we can do a lot to improve it. One of the other great things that started happening is Millennium Kids, a um, Perth-based group run by kids, four kids. Um, it's 21 years old today, I, um, this year I think. Um, it's got three rules of operating, have fun, do good, eat chocolate. So the sort of group we can work with and they um, got a, a multi-year program citizen science program funded through BHP Bulletin and have had lots of kids out in the bush, lots of kids in towns like Kalgoorlie who had actually never been out in the bush that surrounds the town. Did a wonderful art launch some years ago um, and managed to snaffle Tim Flannery to, to give the, um, the main talk. And, you know, the, Kalgoorlie's not a town where you you, you necessarily get away with weaving, waving your environmental credentials all around the place. But when the local school kids run a parade down the middle of the main street of Boulder talking about the values of the great western woodlands, you ask them getting, getting a hearing in the community. There's always hard stuff to be done too, and this slide shows our Wilderness Society and Wildflower Society and BirdLife Australia colleagues who've been campaigning steadily for one of the more beautiful and, and bi biologically important bits of the woodlands, the Helena and Aurora Range. Bungalbin 
in the local language to be protected from mining and this has been going again this has been going on for 15 or 20 years now good for them I hope they have a win in the near future just as the Naju are starting to have a few wins this slide shows a phenomenon I'd never heard about which which is very special for Naju country it's a water tree it's a salmon gum that's been managed carefully since since it was a sapling to produce a multi multitude of stems I think this one's got three and a little basin in between those stems where you know if you look at our dry country eucalypts they're designed to catch water and bring it into the ground around the root system what these water trees do is is on its way down it fills a little bowl of water in the middle of the tree and holds that water for quite a long time I can tell you it tastes a bit tanniny to me but if you're doing a perish out there as you move between granite rock hole to granite rock hole it'd be a really valuable and it is also a watering point point for lots of pigeons and birds so of course it's also a good hunting place so we've helped Naju map these trees and um, early in that process Les and his mate here and I've forgotten the, the young fellow's name came across the main roads department about to take out a water tree so they could stop jump out of their car couldn't quite hold up their Naju deputy sheriff badge but could say look we're the Naju community we've been mapping these trees these are recognised as important please don't knock it over and they didn't that tree's still there it is with great pride I can say that after working with the Naju community for over a decade now and having a formal arrangement since two th early 2013 in the last couple of months we have handed the program over to the Naju we've been running their ranger team and a few other things for conservation planning all that time they've slowly built their capacity they've they've brought in other Naju who have financial management and other skills and we're out of there we've left them with all the gear we've left them with some contracts we we helped them secure and it's just wonderful to see a community get on its feet like this and start managing its own land and here's a picture of the new ranger team and their first training sessions in September you know it's it's just wonderful so how are we going now with gone wandling um, there's been a lot of growth there's been some rapid growth and a few slow periods we have conservation plans across these hatched areas shown on the map um, most of them are being implemented some of them are being implemented very ambitiously some it's quietened down on a bit we've got a few other irons in the fire that will come on the map over the next year we're, we're steadily getting there um, worries me a bit though despite all that we're achieving when you do look at the map and this slide shows all the vegetation left in this central zone inland of Albany um, the pink bits are the restoration that's happened in the last couple of decades we're not responsible for all of it um, but we can certainly claim we're responsible for all the big bits the bits that show up when you you get above the land um, and once you get at this scale above the land or up there in a satellite um, you don't see a lot of the small plantings you've got to worry that they're not making any difference but the big stuff is there we just need more of the the big plantings we need to be more ambitious and um, I don't think Australia has been very ambitious we need to ramp that up and it was a bit um, thought-provoking I think is the polite word for me to be asked to um, last year 2016 to help run a land care masterclass in Zambia where representatives from the African land care network right across southern Africa would be coming along as well as local farmers and, and local government agencies now I didn't know what 
would be happening there. I met the most wonderful group of people. I met the most ambitious and capable group of people who are making a big difference at scale. Um, that's probably the picture. If we slide here of southern Niger in the 1980s, that's probably the picture that a lot of Australians have that you know Africa is desertifying and they're all in famine and hunger and so on. Well this slide shows you the same area 20-25 years later. Um, there is a huge amount of well-managed regeneration happening across key areas of, of Africa, Niger in particular, Ethiopia, I've heard lots of great things about. Um, I've met the people who are making a big difference in Malawi. Um, and I've been in farms a bit like shown in this slide. The early thoughts of agroforestry we had in Australia haven't really come true. But in Africa they have. These guys are growing their own fertiliser. They have um, worked out the species of trees that you can interrow with in this case the maize crops um, and which increase production quite significantly they're claiming six to eight hundred kilogram a hectare extra maize um, and it's it, it softens the landscape for all the wildlife that they still have there um, two websites really good to look at evergreen agriculture and FMNR, um, Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration. And AFR 100, the, this slide shows the cover of, of their um, brochure. AFR one, AFR 100, the, the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, is a bunch of countries across Africa that have committed to planting 100 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. Wow, I mean, Australia, we're still talking about 20 million tree programs. Um, these are the, the slide shows the countries that have already made binding commitments, and top of the list there is Malawi. Well, I've been talking to the guys who've already done over a million hectares of that commitment. Um, I, I think Australia does need to set these sort of large targets and get on with things. And, you know, we, we got down to village level. We, we met people doing it bit by bit. I don't fully understand all that's happening in Africa. Um, you don't get to be that good an expert after a few weeks. But I did see this ambition and vision at the highest levels. Um, it is built from on-ground successes. It, it is a collective effort across the scales and the jurisdictions. Um, and they, they're doing it Co cooperatively across, in, in this case, the Southern African development community, even though some of them have been at war with each other, there's, there's significant profit, poverty, the ever-present risk of hunger. We had, we had farmers commit to work they would do on their properties and sort of say, in an, almost an afterthought, and I hope it works, otherwise we'll go hungry. Now, Australia, you know, these guys are, are being able to pull money from the global um, car, climate fund and so on, but they need that. They're not a rich community. We don't need that substantial external funding. We should be able to be this ambitious. Similarly, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing some work in New Zealand. Um, Reconnecting Northland is apparently a program that Gondwan Link helped to inspire. And the, the guy in the middle of this slide up the top, um, Trevor Gray, has been over here a couple of times. Um, he was the manager of the Tyndall Foundation that has underwritten this scheme. So there's been a really healthy interchange of ambition, vision and technique across, across countries emanating at least partly from the work we've done here. Um, so there's a lot for us all to think about. And um, this slide has one of my local heroes, Lucia Query from out at the Prongrups pondering the landscape in a photo just as for so many years of her life she's not just pondered the landscape but has taken action to, to help the country. That's me done.